This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and Macy's. Hey, y'all, what's up? It's your girl, Lene Vanee. I'm a writer, creator, and a change maker. And there's nothing like a powerful statistic to spur me into action. Did you know that one in three U.S. residents, including 28 million children, do not have a park or green space within a 10-minute walk of their home? Well, Macy's and Trust for Public Land are on a mission to change that. They're finding ways to connect everyone to the outdoors. It's Danielle's mission, too. I'm Danielle Dang, National Schoolyard Initiative Director at Trust for Public Land. We've been transforming empty and uninviting schoolyards into thriving learning environments that double as a park after hours. When you create a schoolyard and open it to the community, it welcomes the entire community into that school. It nurtures a much stronger connection. We work directly with the students to design their schoolyard. The students are the designers. They begin to think like landscape architects, civil engineers, architects, planners, and they see themselves as agents of change. We are thrilled to partner with Macy's. Their support of our work has helped us to strengthen existing schoolyard programs and help to start new programs. Now's the time to help communities create parks where they're needed most. This April, when you round up your purchase at Macy's or donate online, you'll help fund Trust for Public Land's Community Schoolyard Initiative. Find out how Macy's is creating brighter futures for all at macy's.com slash purpose. Welcome back to Working Overtime, the advice-focused vermouth to workings Campari and Gin. I'm Isaac Butler. And I'm Karen Hahn. How's uh, things? You, you're. I hear that it's like a book of Genesis, Noah's Ark type situation there in Los Angeles. Is that? It is, is that true? raining a lot. Luckily, my partner and I have not suffered any adverse effects due to the rain. But I've had one, two, three, four, maybe five friends have their apartments flood. So oh it really, th- there's no infrastructure here for rain is the bottom line. Like there's no drains. It just builds up and builds up and builds up. <laughs> yeah. It's also like the roads are terrible. There's just like no, no plans for rain. They're just like, right. we'll never have it. So we don't need to uh, budget for it, which is kind of not true, <laughs> which is not the uh, approach you really want to take. And then there's also been like a Los Angeles tornado. I just imagine Michael Ovitz and his Tesla just floating down the boulevard. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's not out of the question right now. Right. But that said, speaking of questions, I have one for you, which okay. is what are we talking about today? Karen, I wanted to talk about something that's come up a few times in our episodes, but it's never really been front and center. The audience, not the audience mm. for the show, although hi out there. We love you. Please keep listening. Subscribe. Maybe go to slate.com slash working plus right now. <laughs> but the audience for our work, you know, so for example, like I've directed plays and, you know, I I wrote this book called The Method. It's like a cultural history of acting in the 20th century. And, you know, I was thinking a lot about the audience when doing that. And, and, you know, you have written this wonderful book about Bong Joon-ho and you and your writing partner also write for television and you do journalism and all sorts of other work. And a lot of times Mm. we have to talk about who the audience is going to be for that work. The imagined audience. We're not even talking about real people. We're talking about an imaginary audience. So I'm just curious, who are they? How do we make them up? When do we pay attention to them? And when do we not? This is such a fun topic. And I wonder if my answers will be in conflict with your questions. But all right. So no matter what the medium, I would say that I generally start out without thinking about an audience. Mm. What matters to me when I'm starting on a creative project is that in in this pie in the sky stage is whether or not it interests me and whether or not it's actually a story. Because sometimes if you think hard enough about what you're doing, about the story that you're telling, you can poke holes in it and realize that it doesn't really carry water in the way that you'd want it to. Thinking about other people for me starts once I have the shape of whatever I'm working on established already. For journalism, it's figuring out like what outlets run things similar to what I'm trying to write, if there are established columns and features that this idea could fit into. For pitching for TV and movies, it's sort of similar. We're very lucky to have a manager who takes some of the guesswork out of that in that to put it in very broad strokes, like some production companies aren't interested in comedies or aren't interested in dramas. And then the step beyond that is thinking about sort of budget constraints in relation to whatever weight our names do or don't carry. And also 
to a certain extent, it's bullshitting, I would say, where you're like, ooh, this story could be about X moral if you really wanted it to be, if that's what you want, producers. And mm-hmm. it, it sort of gets complicated in that respect. But what does the answer to this question look like for you? That's interesting. I do do a lot of poking holes in my own brain before I think yeah. about anything else. Or, you know, you sort of test the idea. It's all of our nightmare to be like a Naomi Wolf in that BBC interview where oh the guy's God. like, actually, the word death recorded, which is the premise of your whole book, doesn't mean the thing you're saying it means. It means this mm-hmm. completely other thing. And then you just hear that yawning void open to swallow her. <laughs> None of us wants to be in that that position no. right and so I th- so you got to kind of test these ideas kick the tires uh, and things like that but i have often found myself in a situation where i have to articulate who the audience is or you know perhaps because i came from a theater background like i think about the audience because in theater you're eventually gonna have a real life audience right there that you have to contend with mm-hmm. and you know ever since i first started applying for grants right out of college grants i didn't get to be very clear i I always just have trouble with it. I'm always like, I, I, I don't know. My project is for smart people who like good stuff, right? And that's not what, <laughs> that's not going to help you at all. And uh, I just learned the hard way that wasn't a good answer. You know, like you, I have representation that's pretty helpful on that front and things like that. But I also think another thing that's changed over the course of my career now that I'm a thousand years old is that audiences <laughs> are far more fragmented and hyper-targeted than they used to be, right? Like I started my professional career as an artist prior to smartphones or social media and like lots of good stuff has come out of that. But part of it is that audiences have gotten more self-selecting and so like you do have to know who you want to target when it comes time to get the work out there or else it might be seen by no one. I mean, I didn't I don't want my work to be only for one group of people like I was not like the method is just for acting buffs. I want right. lots of different people to like it, lots of different groups. But but I do feel like having some sense of who those groups might be is helpful, both uh, at least in selling it. Yeah. And to a certain extent, I think this circles back to the idea that maybe you shouldn't be thinking too hard about your audience, because (laughs) once you like get too far into that hole, it can kind of cripple what you're doing. Oh, it totally can cripple what you're doing. And I think we all know of like, you know, musicians or novelists or filmmakers who had really long careers. I mean, the perfect example is M. Night Shyamalan after Lady in the Water, right? Where he does the happening where all of America kills itself because they don't respect his work enough. You know, like you could just get to this point where it becomes about the relationship of you to your audience in ways that I think are not very rewarding. We've talked about the first version of the imaginary audience, the one you have to articulate to maybe get the money to make the thing you want to make. But there's Mm -hmm. another one that's really important, which is Is there one in your head when you're actually making the work? We'll talk about that pesky Statler and Waldorf of the mind after this. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and Macy's. Hey, y'all, what's up? It's your girl, Lenevene. I'm a writer, creator, and a change maker. And there's nothing like a powerful statistic to spur me into action. Did you know that one in three U.S. residents, including 28 million children, do not have a park or green space within a 10-minute walk of their home? Well, Macy's and Trust for Public Land are on a mission to change that. They're finding ways to connect everyone to the outdoors. It's Danielle's mission, too. I'm Danielle Dang, National Schoolyard Initiative Director at Trust for Public Land. We've been transforming empty and uninviting schoolyards into thriving learning environments that double as a park after hours. When you create a schoolyard and open it to the community, it welcomes the entire community into that school. It nurtures a much stronger connection. We work directly with the students to design their schoolyard. The students are the designers. They begin to think like landscape architects, civil engineers, architects, planners, and they see themselves as agents of change. We are thrilled to partner with Macy's. Their support of our work has helped us to strengthen existing schoolyard programs and help to start new programs. Now's the time to help communities create parks where they're needed most. This April, when you round up your purchase at Macy's or donate online, you'll help fund Trust for Public Land's Community Schoolyard Initiative. Find out how Macy's is creating brighter futures for all at macy's.com slash purpose. At the end of your first year, Discover credit cards automatically double all the cash back you've earned. That's right. Everything you earned doubled. All the cash back from eating at your favorite soup dumpling restaurant doubled. 
all the cash back from that trip where you sort of learned to snowboard also doubled. And the best part, you don't have to do anything ridiculous to get it. Nope. Discover does it automatically. Seriously, though, see terms and check it out for yourself at discover.com slash match. Hey, listeners, is there a particular creative struggle you'd like to hear us tackle? Let us know by emailing us at working at slate.com or even better, you can call us and leave a message at 304-933-9675. That's 304-933-WORK. All right, Karen, we're back. So let's take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. You've gotten the green light. You're working on the thing. Do you have a person, whether a real person or not, in your head while you're working? Do you find that a helpful thing to do? And if so, who is that person? I don't think I have that person. Or maybe I do, but in a sort of reverse way. Because I think the instinct when you're thinking about an audience is to hold their hand. But I want to give my imaginary audience member the benefit of the doubt and not go overboard in that kind of thing. Like, sure, I'll provide clues as to what I'm saying or like where the story's going, but I don't want to be hammering them over the head with it. And this applies a little more to fiction than it does to my journalistic work, to be fair, where being more explicit can often be a good thing. But I think you know what I mean. What about you? Usually I don't think of an actual specific person, but, you know, when I was thinking about this question for this episode and trying to think about the imagined reader in my head and their attributes, I realized that maybe the person I actually have in, in my head is just my wife. Um, hear, hear, hear me. I know it's very sweet, but, you know, like Anne is interested in many of the same things I am. We were both in theater. We're the same age. She's very knowledgeable about arts and politics, and she certainly knows more about economics and the business world than I do. But, you know, she has a full time job in the corporate world. She's not a cultural critic or historian. So there's certain areas of expertise I have that that she doesn't. And on top of that, she's a very busy person with a demanding job and a kid and a complicated life. So the reader, if it's her, right, it's someone is knowledgeable, but not an expert and someone who needs a book that is conscious of the fact that they're a busy person on some level that like is devoted to a certain level of entertainment is devoted to a certain extent, even when the work becomes difficult of pulling them through, uh, the story. So like with the method, I'm, I don't have to explain what world war two is. I don't have to explain what the new deal was, but I definitely have to explain what the failed 1905 revolution in Russia was because I'm not writing for Russia experts. And that's actually the area where I find the imagined audience the most helpful is figuring out what exposition is needed and what exposition is not. So how do you use this or how do you use not knowing who the reader is or whatever <laughs> to kind of help you through the big process of writing a big thing? In a pretty similar way, honestly, like, again, I don't think about a specific person when doing this, but I think it's a sort of common sense thing where there are certain events you assume are big enough that you don't have to explain them in too much detail. Right. But also, this is where it can be helpful to be working with an editor where sometimes they'll err more on the side of caution or a frame your thought that you don't need to explain the moon landing. <laughs> totally. I read this biography that was good, but it was like very long, like 900 pages long. And it was a, mm -hmm. of a of a painter. And the reason why it was so long was that it kept doing stuff like there's like a chapter on Pearl Harbor. Okay. Right. And you're like, why are you giving me like a minute by minute recounting of Pearl Harbor? The painter was in New York at the time. Why aren't they just like when they read about Pearl Harbor? I know what Pearl Harbor is, you know, like, like the, like so much of it was that it was, it was really wild, you know? And I, it just felt like there was a real anxiety there about the reader getting everything, which you've said, mm -hmm. it's like, you don't want to hold their hand all the time. You want them to be an active participant in the book. And it's like growing up, I didn't get a hundred percent of the references in the Simpsons and that didn't stop me mm -hmm. from loving it. You know, I doubt any reader actually noticed that the method has this like motif of quotes from Hamlet in it, for example, you know, like, like how do you worry about or, or navigate is the reader going to get everything or the viewer? Oh man, I, I don't, but maybe I should because I feel like as per my previous, previous answer, I tend to go in the opposite direction, if anything. Like if I don't know what something is, I'm happy to go Google it and look it up. And I sort of hope that my reader will too, for the sake of avoiding the kind of thing that you're saying about like the Pearl Harbor chapter, or like, I feel like I've had this a lot in like recent, watching recent movies where I'm like, 
every beat is so spelled out that I'm like, I, there's no surprise or suspense to this. There's no work that I'm putting in as a viewer. And obviously, like, when you're watching a movie, the idea is not, I want to work really hard. I want this to be a brain puzzle. But it also shouldn't just be like a pudding cup. Does this make sense? I absolutely agree. You know, you have to create room for the audience member to enter the work. And that takes mm-hmm. a little work on their part, but it's very pleasurable. It's pleasurable yeah. for your mind to do that kind of work. You know, Ruman, when he was the co-host of working, would talk about this all the time about like, you know, people can look up a word if they don't know what it means. It's not the end yeah. of the world. If a reader doesn't know what a word is like, we have dictionaries on our phones. It's not hard, you know? Yeah, I totally agree. It's like, I hope that whoever is looking at or consuming what I've done isn't incurious. Yes, it's the curiosity. You want to meet them in the, in the realm of curiosity. Your curiosity about whatever you're writing about and their curiosity about the thing you've written. And that's yeah. like the space that you can inhabit together. And there's something really beautiful about that, I think. When we come back, we will talk about when you need to not listen to the audience in your head and what it's like to finally meet the real, in the flesh, not imaginary audience. Stay tuned. At the end of your first year, Discover credit cards automatically double all the cash back you've earned. That's right. Everything you earned doubled. All the cash back from eating at your favorite soup dumpling restaurant doubled. All the cash back from that trip where you sort of learned to snowboard also doubled. And the best part, you don't have to do anything ridiculous to get it. Nope. Discover does it automatically. Seriously, though, see terms and check it out for yourself at discover.com slash match. Hey, listeners, Isaac Butler here. I just want to remind you that if you are enjoying working overtime, why don't you subscribe so that you never miss an episode? And that way you will be our real audience, not our imaginary audience. And if you listen on Apple Podcasts, we'd love for you to rate or review the show. It really does help new listeners find us. If you don't listen on that, maybe there's some other way, like if Overcast is your app of choice, you can hit the star to recommend this episode to others. Thanks so much. And thank you for listening to Working. Karen, do you ever feel like you have to tell your imagined audience member like, hey, you know, why don't you why don't you take 10? Go out for a cigarette and STFU a little bit for a while. I mean, like, I know that I can sometimes get so nervous, like my inner critic can take over to such an extent that it can be so worried. Like, is this going to work? Will this work or whatever? That it's hard for me to, like, actually do it and put out that, you know, the shitty first draft that's going to be rewritten into Mm -hmm. something good. I feel like I'm learning that I don't think about my imaginary audience too much or maybe just not as much as you because I I obviously suffer the same worries as everyone else as to whether or not a project I'm working on will go over well. But when I'm actually working on it, my main concern is always whether or not I like it, whether or not I think it makes sense. There are a couple of people I'll always run my stuff by to make sure that they like it because I trust their taste like before I show it to my manager or whatever. But I'm also not thinking about them when I'm working. Is that crazy? No, I actually think what we're learning here is that you're far less neurotic than I am and you're a much healthier (laughs) person and it has suited you much better and that's why you have such wisdom and accomplishment beyond your years while I'm an old (laughs) crazy gargoyle rotting away here in my bedroom in Brooklyn. that's not true. Listeners, you know, you can always write us at workingitslate.com and weigh in on which one of us you think is crazy. We'll gladly uh, take those (laughs) emails and answer them in a timely fashion. That's at workingitslate.com. Anyway, final part of this, though, you know, is, of course, there is a real audience. And at some point, your work is going to meet that person. And you get to find out what they took away from it or how they responded to it. And honestly, good, bad, or indifferent. I find their reactions always surprising, like the things they fixate on or have questions about or what they're interested in about the work. Sometimes you're like, oh, God, I I wasn't even I don't even remember that. You know, it's Mm -hmm. a reminder of how little control over this stuff we actually have. What was surprising for you from your conversations with uh, readers of Bong Joon-ho dissident cinema? I've been really lucky in that all the people that I've met who have read my book have been really generous and kind in what they've had to say. The couple of exceptions that I have to the rule where I was like, wait, what? Like, aren't things that are necessarily, like, good or that relevant to my work? Like, one of them was I read a review of the book, which I I don't know if I should have done. I shouldn't have gone looking for it. And it was like, she doesn't talk about this, though. And I was like, wait, I can, like, clearly point to the part in my chapter where I do talk about exactly what you're talking about. So I don't know what that is about. 
And then the other one was someone um, asked me basically why I didn't include their interpretation of a certain scene in my book. But that is more of like boils down to some of the problems that I have with modern criticism, which is that more and more stuff is framed as I'm right, you're wrong, rather than opinion, which is ultimately what all criticism is, unless the director has explicitly said otherwise. But again, that's not really about my book. It's just about like interactions with people that are less less in the audience context that I think that you're talking about. What about you? Yeah, I I totally know what you mean. And I just want to put in like a little note here to say, and I say this as someone who writes reviews myself, like the only things in reviews of the method that annoyed me are when people said, you know, Butler never talks about X. And it's like, I could actually send you a list of pages in which that thing is discussed explicitly. And (laughs) that experience actually really changed how I think about writing my own reviews. And that like, I do think it's like, you really got to say, this book never does why like books are long. You, you may actually have just forgotten that it did it at some point by the time you get to the end. So what you're really thinking is like, it doesn't talk enough about this, which is a Mm. far more defensible point to try to make. But like when you're trying to do a gotcha on the writer about how they never did X, like you're actually opening yourself up to the, the charge that you just didn't read it that carefully, you know? Yeah. I guess for me, what I thought was interesting, like, look, the book got some great reviews. It got a couple of negative reviews. It got great reader reviews. It's gotten negative reader reviews. You know, it, it ran the spectrum and that's wonderful. That's fine. You know, what I found that was really interesting were the conversations I had with people who had an actual real life stake in the material readers mm-hmm. who had studied with one of the, you know, acting gurus that the book is about. So like Lee Strasberg is such a controversial figure and he's the guy who codified the method and the method is so controversial that what I found was a lot of time in conversations with people they just sort of took away that I had validated their pre-existing point of view Hmm. you know so some people read it and said to me you know I knew it there's really nothing there and he was a charlatan and it's a cult which I do not believe and others (laughs) said things like you know thank you for showing the world how important Lee's contribution was you know he really is the one person who got it right I don't believe that either you know Um, I tried to show a, a new nuanced, complex picture of these issues. And it's just interesting how that gets that's filtered out. You know, they all read the same book. It's really weird. It's really a a reminder of how subjective uh, our appreciation of these things really are. Yeah, absolutely. And like, again, like this is it sort of comes back to what I was saying about criticism, where it's like, there's really no right or wrong answer most of the time in these things. It's just you took this out of the movie, film or book or whatever, and you can back it up using like X points like from the material. But that doesn't mean that someone else can't view it differently. That's true. There is only one objectively right and good thing. And that is to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. (laughs) And if you have questions you'd like us to address, you know, we would love to hear from you. So another, there's a second, there's a second good and right thing you could do, which is to email us at workingatslate.com or give us a ring at 304-933-WORK. As you have probably guessed, that's all the time we have uh, for talking about the imaginary audience today. But we're really grateful to you, our real audience. And if you'd like to support what we do, sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash working plus. You'll get bonus content, including exclusive episodes of Slow Burn and Big Mood, Little Mood. And you'll be supporting what we do right here on Working. Big thanks to Kevin Bendis and to our series producer, Cameron Drews. We'll be back on Sunday with a brand new episode of Working. And in two weeks, we'll have another Working Overtime. Until then, get back to work. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe. No.